Thank you, Pastor Kyle. Oh, man. Oh, hey, got the woos already. Found out woo is one of my strengths. Anybody else? Winning others over? Anyway, woo! <laughs> Everybody do it. <laughs> this sounds like Ric Flair is about to walk in. <laughs> All right, that's, that's nothing to do with this morning. Man, Freedom Church, uh, if we haven't got a chance to meet, my name is, is Andrew Lahan. I'm our, our youth, young adults, and leadership school director, pastor, whatever you want to call it. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Wow. <laughs> Woo! Are we just, is this gonna be a morning of woos? I really hope so. If you hear anything that's good, and if you just wanna let one go, free place. We are a woo-friendly church. Anyway, let's, uh, let's pray. I asked the first service, like, how many prayers is too many prayers in church? Like, we have these certain spots that we pray, but like, you know, can we do, can we do one more? I want you to take your little hand, I want you to put it over your heart. We're not gonna pledge allegiance. We're just gonna pray, and I wanna pray, uh, and we're doing this just to connect with ourselves um, because I want you to take it personal today. I want you to hear things today. I want you to hear what God has to say. I want you to hear things from the word, but also, this will be a waste of time if we don't take it personal. So, Jesus, it's us again. You may remember Freedom Church from earlier. Lord, I'm asking you right now, to come into this room and do what only you can. I'm asking you right now to help us grow. Lord, I'm asking you to come do what we just sang, for dead things to come to life, for the dead and dormant to live and live again, for chains to be broken, for eyes to be opened. Lord, I've been feeling this on my heart really, really heavy that you would increase the integrity of this church body. You would increase the integrity of this house. And Lord, that human reasoning would be secondary. Jesus, please, please open our eyes and let us be a people that brings your people back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we are gonna talk about Discipleship. Woo! This is gonna be the greatest Sunday ever. So fun. We're talking about discipleship. Okay. Um, it has been a season of essentials. How many of you remember the very, very uh, traumatizing months of quarantine? When we decided real fast what was essential to life and what wasn't? In fact, for some reason, the whole nation decided that having mountains of toilet paper was far more essential than anything. It's a season of essentials. Whenever something changes in you, whenever something changes around you, when perspectives get changed, or when things shut down or whatever, it really, really helps you see what truly matters and what doesn't. Essentials, I believe, Discipleship is an essential to the Christian faith. In fact, last week, Pastor Kyle. Woo! Man, you guys left me hanging on that one. Um, Pastor Kyle talked about evangelism, about sharing your faith, spreading the good news of Jesus. Not being a crazy street preacher, but just carrying out the message of the good news of Christ. And I believe that discipleship and evangelism are two absolute essentials to the Christian faith. In fact, these two essentials fully encapsulate, fully represent the go and do of Jesus. Go and do. What do I mean? The go and do, okay? If you look into the gospel, if you look into the New Testament and you look through Jesus's ministry, there's a lot of moments with a lot of people. It's crazy. But you can sum up interactions he has with people. He, he often either prompts somebody to come in or prompts somebody to go out. And it usually looks one of three ways. You can kind of sum up all of those encounters by this. Jesus either says, come and see. He says, sit and wait. Or he says, go and do. Now, we really like number one. 
like American church, American culture outside of the church, American culture inside of the church. We love, number one, come and see, come taste, come experience, come on in, see what it is, adrenaline, fun, energy, beauty, art, elegance. Come and see. Come and see. Why? We get to consume. What do we know about America? We're a consumer culture. We love the come and see of Jesus. Come to Freedom Church. Come to Night of Worship. See what God is doing. It's beautiful. Come and see. We get a little bit flustered when it comes to number two, the sit and wait. Ah, not so good at the sitting nor the waiting. Ooh. Ooh. We get frustrated with that because I'd say the majority of the room, God, give me patience. And then you get a chance to have patience. No, 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 God. No. Or we really love the experience and the hype and the excitement and the energy and the emotion behind come and see, but the second that goes away, we ditch because we don't want to sit and wait to discover more. So we get pumped on that. We get a little confused and frustrated here. But collectively, we almost ignore the go and do. It's not really there if I don't look at it. Love it, confused, frustrated, ignored. Discipleship, man. Discipleship is essential to the very core of what Christianity is. And usually when you see the word discipleship up on a screen at a church, it's followed by like a sales pitch to sign up for a class or something, which by the way, we do have these flyers for classes. We have discipleship courses and uh, we have classes starting soon if you would like to join one. However, discipleship somewhere along the line, like this is, I mean, the, the crux of Jesus's ministry is discipleship. And somewhere over decades and centuries, we've made it this mythical word that none of us really understand. Discipleship this, discipleship that, discipleship conferences, disciple, and we've made it this thing that, that involves more like a plan or a curriculum. Look, we, I have this book right here. This is the Project 52 book. Some of you may have gone through this. We were given these uh, during a crazy season called Revive Texas, and it was a big evangelistic focus, but they're like, you can't have evangelism without discipleship, so they gave us these books. And what this book is, is it's a 52-week walkthrough to help expand and, and, and bring faith into someone's life, to help somebody grow in their own faith. It's meant to have this one-on-one -on -one connection with somebody, and you guys walk through this together. But listen, this book is not discipleship. It's good, there's good stuff in there, but discipleship is not a class, it is not a curriculum. It is not a plan, it is not a procedure, it is not a program. Discipleship is just vulnerable time spent. Now, that can set you up in the posture and the place where discipleship can occur. Think about like the spiritual disciplines, okay? Prayer, reading, fasting, meditation. Deep spiritual disciplines that the Lord calls us to. Listen, dude. Fasting does not equal closeness to God. Please don't boo me off stage. Reading your Bible does not equal closeness to God. We've all had like the atheist friend in high school who said, I read through the whole Bible and I don't even believe in God. And you're like, how did you read through the whole Bible and you weren't compelled? Right? It's because you just read it. You didn't go into it. You didn't look into it. You weren't trying to find anything in there. Reading your Bible doesn't equal closeness. Fasting doesn't equal closeness. Prayer doesn't equal closeness. But these spiritual disciplines ought to be in your life, not because they equal closeness, that's ritualistic, but they're there to posture you in a place for closeness. Fasting, look, if you just don't eat and call it fasting, that's a diet. That's a really bad diet. Fasting. When you get, dude, I don't even, I don't believe people that I'm fasting Hershey Kisses this month. Bro, that ain't fasting. You're just gonna not eat candy for a minute. I'm fasting my computer. I'm fasting breakfast cereal. Nah, man, fasting is refraining from your own appetite. Why? 
Because you're saying, Lord, I'm going to lay down something I know I need, and instead of filling my appetite with what I can go get, I'm coming to you with my appetite, believing you can fill me. Fasting is to put you in a vulnerable place to experience God in a different way. But just not eating is not intimacy. Like, that's, that's just ritualistic stuff, and that's what the Bible rips apart. It's our personal responsibility to bring fundamentals, functionality, and faith to the next, I, I was gonna say next generation of believers, but like understand, next generation doesn't just mean the little bitty ones, the kids, the youth, the young adults. Next generation of believers is like the next sequence of believers, the ones who are to become the believers and followers of Christ next. You can be 65 years old and be a new coming next generation believer. We ought to be showing people how this faith exists outside of a moment, outside of the come and the see. If disciples don't keep making disciples, then everyone everywhere will attach their identities to everything. So, here we are, Freedom Church, continuing the prompts of Jesus to come and see, to sit and wait, and to go and do. Last week, Pastor Kyle I was almost certain we forgot about the woos. Thank you. Last week, you, uh, you talked about evangelism. Super good word, very good word. And then you showed us something that was so simple, so nice. You showed us this little acronym, G-O-S-P-E-L. Yep, that was right. Like, they don't pay me to spell. <laughs> Speaking of spell, the gospel is what we looked at. <clears throat> The gospel, you gave us this nice little acronym and it had little words behind it and you said, I made this or I found this to show my kids when they were little so they would know the good news of Jesus and it would be embedded in them at a young age. And then we all saw this, yeah, we saw it, we all busted out our iPhones or our Androids and we took photos of this and we were oohed and odd and wowed and, and, and looking at this, like wow, I've never seen it like this, which a side note, it was exciting to see people go, oh wow, that's really good, I can you know, take advantage of that, I can see that, I can use that, because it's simple. At the same time, it was a little bit alarming because do we not know it? Is this really in us? So we see this, the gospel, this is what it is. Simplified, that God created us to be with him, our sins separate us from God, sin can't be removed by good deeds, but paying the price for sins, Jesus died and rose again, and everyone who believes in Jesus will have eternal life, and life with Jesus starts today and lasts forever. Now, we are allowed to and invited in to come and to see the gospel. That's why you're here. Those of you who have been in church for a long time, you were invited to come and see, and this was new news to you. We forget how good the good news is to come in and to see that God created us to be with him, to come in and see that sin can't be removed by good deeds, but also to come in and hear that life with Jesus starts today and lasts forever. Oh, come and see, baby. But sometimes it's where we stop. We don't learn how to sit with the gospel, how to wait with the gospel, how to let it marinate in the seasons of life because we come and see, we experience, and we're full, but then after that, it's so easy to give up or to stay so stagnant and complacent because we have not learned to sit in the hard seasons, to sit in the tough seasons, to sit when we don't feel it, right? And to create the spiritual discipline inside of ourselves, really truly believing that it's the living word, it's not the feeling word. Yeah, Sitting and waiting with the gospel is difficult then we nearly ignore the go and do. Go and do the gospel. Come and see the gospel. Sit with the gospel. Wait with the gospel. Learn with the gospel. But also, go and do the gospel. Paul writes this in Colossians chapter two. Says this. He says, my counsel for you is simple and straightforward in Freedom Church. The same is true for us today. The same is true for me to you. My counsel is simple and straightforward. My sermon is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You received Christ Jesus the master. Now live him. 
You're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. Okay, time for school. Well, he's saying to you, school's out. Stop studying the subject and start living it and let your living spill over into thanksgiving. Woo. It's a lot less woos the more personal we take it. Not only must you learn this, but you must live it and you must share it. I will say this, please still be my friend after. Um, go back to the gospel, please. If this is not flowing out of you, it might not be in you. If this is not coming out of you, permeating into people's lives around you, it might not be in you. I do believe this, and just roll with me. Look, I'm not saying you don't have salvation. I'm saying, yeah, you came, you saw, you experienced. You do have Christ in you. You do have Christ as your Savior. But maybe you haven't sat in it. Maybe you haven't waited in it. You haven't allowed it to fill you up and really fully embrace the truth of Christ Jesus and the good news. I do believe this, at least at 29 years old, I think I believe this, so if one day I may change it, who knows. I, I do believe that, that what you really believe is directly represented by the fruit of your life. Like what you really believe in. Show me what's around your life, the successes, the wins, or the lack of, and I'll show you what you actually believe in. A lot of us believe in our bank accounts more than Jesus. A lot of us believe in our children's extracurricular sports and activities and them excelling than we do Christ and him crucified. You show me the fruit that is coming out of your life and I will show you what you actually believe in. I was praying in the chapel last Friday, um, our little chapel over here, just thinking about today and I like started crying because I, like I was pumped, man. Like, okay, let's talk about discipleship. Lord, what do you wanna say? And then I just had this thought that kind of crushed me a little bit, um, thinking about Freedom Church. And, and so I just wanna say this, that if, if you are not firsthand discipling someone, like if you're not exploring and adventuring into the Bible, the presence of God, into conversations, into questions, into weird concerns and doubts, into life seasons, if you are not on this adventure with somebody, pouring into somebody, loving on somebody, if you are not firsthand discipling someone, then I don't know if we believe in the same God. At least, I don't know if we believe him to be who he says he is. I don't know if we agree on that. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm not saying you don't believe in him. I'm not saying you don't have salvation. I'm just, I think that, um, I think you just might believe in a much cheaper version of him. You're buying like the knockoff version of God. It stinks because, um, Sometimes we have a closer relationship with our favorite outfits than we do with Jesus. Why do I use that specific illustration? Because, think about it, man. As long as it looks good, as long as it feels good, as long as it gets the results I need it to get, and does what it does for me, I'm happy. Sometimes we treat this whole thing like it's this outfit we wear. As long as it looks good, as long as it feels good, boosts my confidence a little bit, as long as it gets me a few results, makes me happy. Bro, Jesus ain't a t-shirt. I, uh, I need us to be a people, I, I need us. We need, we need us to be a people that will go and do. Yeah. 
Because God is stirring something in this church, in this house, that is real. It's not just like, oh, it's awesome, we put it on a postcard and whatever. It's something, something to, there's, there's something that the Lord is stirring up here. And if we will not grasp the go and do, if we don't grasp the discipleship side of things, if we don't pull people into our lives as we walk this out, we will miss it. Also, Intimate, close relationships with Jesus should not be left up to chance. Ah, oh, it'll, you know. We, we, do, we act like people, just, it just happens by chance. Well, maybe they'll get close to God. It's not my responsibility. We treat, we treat it like it's this faith lottery where a few lucky people win out and get close to him. Dude, what are we? I want to go get them and bring them in here. Tell them who they are, who they belong to. Show them how to walk through life when it's a whole mess of a storm. It's not up to chance, man. It's time to get into somebody's business, to be intentional. And dude, like I'm not talking about, so you talked about evangelism, okay? Pastor Kyle last week talks about evangelism, sharing your faith. Evangelism has been tainted over the years and got really weird for a while. Evangelism isn't getting up on the table preaching. It's not street preaching. Evangelism, evangelism is not going and knocking on people's doors, getting to repeat after you, and then walking away going, yes, got one. It's not evangelism. The evangelist, by definition, is an enthusiastic advocate. You are to enthusiastically advocate for the kingdom of God by sharing who God is for you, who he's been through you, who he's been around you. That's evangelism, all right? And, and, and look, you, you can't make it this cheap inversion of, like I said, it's not this, this street preaching thing. It's not this radical go out there and just start, dude, I was at racetrack down the street on Hebron and this lady was evangelizing to me. I was getting gas and getting Skittles. No shame. She comes up to me, and, and she's like, can I ask you a question? I'm like, I feel like you're gonna anyways. <laughs> Do you know what it takes to get to heaven? I'm like, I, leave me alone. Like, I didn't explain, oh, I'm a pastor. No, I just like, no, what, tell me. <laughs> just because. But, but I, I like left that situation like, it's like exciting to go, okay, well you're trying, all right? But it's like, what are you doing? You, you don't, evangelizing and discipling is not like force feeding somebody something you ought to think they know, or something you think they ought to know. You're not shoving it down their throat. Evangelism, discipleship comes with the people that God has so graciously put around you already. The circles, the friends, the coworkers, the family, the people that God has actually let you be invited into. That's where evangelism and discipleship comes into play. It's intimate, vulnerable, just time spent with somebody. And everybody's like, well, uh, no, no, no. Uh, you're supposed to be the evangelist. You're supposed to be the discipler. Why, because I'm a pastor, I'm up on the stage yelling at you from microphone? Listen, we're all called to different stuff. I'm just some weird 29-year-old trying to chase my car and still trying to figure things out just like you. You're still trying to figure things out and that's the beauty of the good news is that though we're imperfect and trying to figure stuff out we don't know what's going on and we're totally winging it on stage right now, God still moves through it. And you're like, oh, but oh, man, I'm not called to preach, I'm not called to teach. Baloney, look, everybody wants to bring it up to this podium. Listen, you wanna, like, hey, I'm not qualified to get up there and stand behind this thing and preach. Listen, it's not about preaching up here. It's about packing it up and taking it with you because your life is your biggest message, not anything you gotta say. You ought to have one of these in your back pocket. Uh, it's not that heavy. I wish it was heavier. and look way cooler through all my stuff. Sorry, iPad, you're worth more than that. Oh, where are we? Discipleship is so showing somebody how to keep doing this in the middle of life. There's a lot of people in here that's got, that have a lot of wild stories. Some of them I know, some of them I don't know. But you still show up, or maybe you showed up today. It's awesome. Show somebody else why you showed up. 
And why you keep showing up. Show somebody. Let them know what it looks like to still try to live out and belong to and be a part of and live in and accept and appreciate and dwell in the good news in the middle of divorce. Show them what it's like to walk through when a child passes away. Show them what it's like to come in and to sit with these people when you really don't even wanna be around anyone. Show them why. That's discipleship, man. Colossians 2, let's look at it again. Verse six. (laughs) My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given and we keep disqualifying ourselves. There's this imaginary line that we've made up that once we get there, then, then we'll share our story. Then we'll share our faith. Then we'll teach. Then we'll be a scholar. Then we'll preach. Then we'll do all. There's this invisible qualifier that we will never let ourselves get to. Where even is the line? At what point do you become somebody that now God can use? He says, just go ahead with what you've been given. Look, for me, I am a Bible college dropout. Let me just be vulnerable. I am a Bible college dropout. On paper, I have very little qualifications to stand up here and talk to you. But I quit Bible school because I got hired here. I got called into the league. But like, it, does it, like at what point are we just making up qualifiers? Dude, I'm a student of the word. I ain't got no bachelors. But I, I wish I had a pun right there. But I gotta pretend I said something funny. Thank you. Go with what you've been given. You're like, man, I'm only a few days into church life. I'm only a few few baby steps in. How can I share a faith that I'm not even sure if I have? Look, if you're on day seven, help somebody on day one show you what got you to day seven. Go ahead with what you've been given. Listen, stop disqualifying yourself from the go and the do. We keep acting like we have to be these perfect representations. No imperfect person will ever be the perfect representation of a perfect God, but it's in the imperfections that he is made perfect, and it's in the imperfections that we bond with each other through relating to each other, through discipling each other and saying, wow, can you believe who our God actually is in the middle of this junk? The imperfections are what tie us together. Dude, keep going. Next verse says this. Says, you receive Christ, the master. Now live him. Not just live in him, which is true. Not just let him live in you, which is also true. But you live him. You literally continue to be him. Next verse. You're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do, woo, do. Why didn't we do that from the beginning? Do, I'm losing it. Now do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. Now that doesn't mean don't study your Bible. Always study the Bible. Always dive into it. What this is saying is stop sitting still at your desk and get up and go do something with what you've been looking at. I wrote this down. A lot of us, uh, this was just during worship, I grabbed like a connect card and wrote this down. A lot of people in this room, we're looking for more. God, give me more. I'm looking, Lord, I just wanna see more. I wanna experience more. Lord, I know, I just, I know there's more. I wanna come and I wanna see it. Or Lord, I've been sitting and waiting. I know there's more. Is it possible that the more you're looking for, that there might be more in the places you've yet to go? That there's something waiting for you? Because listen, when you go and you start discipling, you will see God move. You will see over two, three, four, five years, which is like, whoa, what a long time. Are you kidding me? There are people I went to high school with that I haven't talked to in 10 years who just like text me, say, hey man, I'm just going through something. Will you pray for me? And I get a chance now because of a seed that was planted a long time ago to do something about it. And or you're so upset because your teenagers are being weird teenagers. Guess what? You are currently discipling them and they may bug you now, but in 10 years, the things you placed in them and the things you walked them through and how they saw you respond to conflict will benefit them later. Woo! 
I have this little cut on my thumb right now, which is really inconvenient while I'm speaking. It keeps like opening. I got this little thumb cut. Ask me where I got it. Red lobster on a crab leg. <laughs> Ask me why I was at Red Lobster. I was chomping that ultimate feast and it was good, but it was a Red Lobster in Phoenix. Why was I in Phoenix? Why was I in Phoenix? Because I was with Pastor Kyle this weekend. He got asked to go out there and speak at this like digital youth conference where it's all about sharing faith, all about students being risen up and all that. And he got invited out there, not me, but he took me with him. And so this little cut is this silly little reminder today while I'm talking about discipleship that I'm still somebody that's getting brought into someone else's life, that I'm still somebody that I'm allowing myself to be discipled by someone further ahead than me, that somebody saw me as worth their time and said, hey, why don't you come to Phoenix with me? Because while we're sitting there, after I was wiping the blood off my thumb, after I cut it on a crab leg, because I'm not good at the pinchy things, I just break it. After that happened, we started talking about finances. Hey, how's this looking? How's your future looking? How's your savings looking? We started talking about marriage. How's all that? How are you and Kylie? Are you doing well? What are you, what's going on? You know, we, started, we talked about all kinds of life stuff, ministry stuff, future stuff, past stuff. Why? Because somebody saw that I'm worth discipling and pouring into and bringing along. It's still a continuing process, man. I'm still a continued result of him discipling me. You ought to go and you ought to do. Colossians chapter one. Verse 28 to 29 reads like this. It's so good, so good. We preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message. Me, never mind, different. We teach in a spirit, this is so good, man, it's so good. We teach in a spirit of profound common sense. That's all we're doing. So that we can bring each person to maturity. We're making it harder than it needs to be. To be mature is to be basic. G-O-S-P-E-L, that is the gospel. Don't ever let me do that again. Christ, no more, no less. That's what I'm working so hard day after day, year after year, and this is like my new favorite verse, doing my best with the energy God so generously gives me as an enthusiastic advocate for the word of God to evangelize and not just tell people about him, but to try to live this out through the questions, through the concerns, through the seasons, to disciple them and say, come along with me. The end of the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, spot in the Bible that says, go out therefore in my name, Right, creating and making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go out into the ends of the earth, right? Jesus closes by saying this. He says, then instruct them in the practice of all I've commanded you. Why do we act like whenever Jesus says something that involves us doing anything, that he says it and then turns his back on us? He says at the end of the biggest, we call it the Great Commission, the one big send off for all people of God. He says, I will be with you as you do this. Day after day, weird conversation after weird conversation, awkward moment after awkward moment, bold move in the office after bold move in the office. I will be with you day after day, right up until the end of the age. Freedom Church, we must be goers and we must be doers and we must unlearn what we've learned about discipleship. It is not a class, it is not a curriculum. Those things just posture you to be in a place with someone for discipleship to occur. Discipleship is beautiful, but it's not just a system. The system is what gets you there. The system can be a vehicle, but it's not always that. It is vulnerable time spent. We must be goers, we must be doers. You are qualified. 